children of the night. I'm Funky Monkey. Welcome to my house of love. Yes, it's Patreon review time again. Now while the Maven of the Eventide isn't looking, let's explore a little the world of the Vampire. What is it that makes these blood-drinking Nightwalkers so enduringly alluring? Well frankly, I don't know. And truthfully, it's not really that important. What is important is today's subject, Underworld. Released in 2003, Underworld is the first in a series of movies centred around Vampire, Death Dealer, Selene, and her troubles in a secret, centuries-old war between vampires and werewolves, or lichens as they are known here. This movie concerns itself with finding the last known descendant of the first bloodline of both species, in order to create a hybrid and bring peace. While this first instalment garnered a paltry 31% on movie review aggregate site Rotten Tomatoes, the series itself continued several movies more. But let's begin at the beginning, because of course it is a very good place to begin. So grab your crosses and silver stakes, because the night is a war zone when you enter Underworld. I present Celine, a vampire death dealer. She's following a couple of lichens. And why? For one, it's kind of what she does, being a death dealer. And for two... Well, we'll get to that. And after a senseless shootout... She makes an unsettling discovery. Ouch! UV bullets! The Maven of the Eventide is hereby warned that I keep a supply of these myself. Think twice, fanface. But this story is really about Michael Corvin, descendant of a very important bloodline. And both sides vie for him. <laughs> Until he gets a nasty nip from a very bad doggy. Celine manages to get hold but not without taking a hit. Luckily, Michael's a med student, and he patches up our heroine. So apparently, it's a thing in these movies that memories can be shared through the blood. Don't ask me, I didn't write it. Celine returns the favour, and brings Michael to the vampire mansion. But he's having none of it, and escapes. And worse, the current acting leader was in league with the Lycans all along! This is Craven, the distinctly secondary antagonist for this movie. He claims to have single-handedly stopped the Lycan Rebellion 600 years ago, but the truth is, he made a pact with them instead. Also, he has the hots for Selene, but he'd never admit it. Back at the mansion, Selene seeks guidance, but from the wrong elder. You see, these vampires have three elders. Victor, Amelia, and Marcus. See what they did there? And they have a system in place. Each elder rules for a hundred years, then sleeps for two hundred, while the other two take their turns. At the change, they pass on the knowledge from the previous century to the incoming elder. As far as I can fathom, the cycle begins with Victor, then Amelia, then Marcus. The 21st century was supposed to be Marcus's to rule, but Selene awakens Victor because she's already figured out Craven's plan. Michael returns to the mansion, and Selene leaves her mess behind. And in a quiet moment, Selene recounts her tale. Come now, children of the night, and hear the sad, sad tale of Selene. For you see, the first time that she laid eyes upon Victor, she was but a human noblewoman. 
It was Victor who claims to have saved her from a lichen attack, and given her the power to take her vengeance for the rest of eternity. The truth of the matter is... somewhat different. But again, we'll get to that. Back at the mansion, Celine explains herself to Victor. Which goes about as well as you'd expect. And worse, current elder Amelia and the Vampire Council are ambushed by lichens. But someone would prefer Celine out of the picture. And Celine swiftly escapes. But she was followed. And Michael is kidnapped while trying to escape. Which is doubly traumatic when the full moon appears. Back at the mansion, Celine has an expert witness. But Victor seems unsettled by his ideas. There can be no such union. Now, what is Victor's problem with hybridization? The threat of sterility? The lower orders rising up? As far as I could fathom, something something pure blood is the best that we got. And Michael has been brought before Lucian, Lycan leader, who finally explains just what this whole thing is all about. And so we come to it at last. Or we would, if it wasn't already a movie in its own right. Underworld Rise of the Lycans. The prequel movie which came after the sequel. But anyway, the short version is, at the time in the 1400s, the Lycans were the slaves of the vampires. Daylight guardians. Lucian speaks of being born into servitude. But he bore them no ill will. Hell, he even shacked up with Victor's daughter, Sonia. Even got her pregnant. Which wasn't the best of ideas, seeing as Victor was something of a pure blood fanatic anyway. So much of a pure blood fanatic that he executed his own daughter, chained her up, and exposed her to sunlight. Of course, Lucian was having none of it, managed to get free. Wolfed out, grabbed Sonya's locket, and noped his way out of there. So it was around this time that he made the deal with Craven. Craven would get the credit, and Lucian would lay low and gather his strength and forces so that he could one day topple Victor. And so the two collaborators attempt to rework their plan. Which goes about as well as you'd expect when Celine's. No. Let's be honest here. When Victor's forces attack. And Craven lives up to his name, shooting Lucian with silver nitrate. But then, Celine reaches Michael. Which quickly goes south when they discover Craven. And Craven has his own tale to tell. You see, the night Victor turns Celine. Craven claims to have been there. Now most of these vamps can live off animal blood. You know, any kind of living thing's blood. But Victor has... expensive tastes. Expensive as in human. So that night, it was he, not some random lichens, that killed off all of Celine's family. So why did he not kill off Celine too? Because she reminded him so very, very much of his dear departed Sonia. And then, Craven finally gets some measure of consequence, thanks to a not quite dead Lucian. And Celine finally gets the picture, adding her own gift to Michael's. Enter Victor for a final showdown. Long story short, Victor dies. So that was Underworld, but I can't put this one into my house of love. This movie is dark, visually and in tone. It's very sombre and serious about its narrative and the setting up of an entire world, which leads to the problem, once again, of Originitis. Too much time is spent on the backstory and not enough on characterization. And of the performances, I've seen these actors being Michael Sheen, Bill Nye, and Kate Beckinsale, in brighter, better-directed fare. Still, 
they make the best of what they have. Though lumped with this po face script, they still manage to keep the attention. Really though, I don't care for Beckinsale's Ice Queen act in the early scenes, or buy her attraction later on. And the less said about Scott Speedman's performance, the better. The flow of the movie seems more concerned with gunplay and exposition than actual character. The opening gun battle doesn't feel exciting, as we're not invested. It's just one bunch of people shooting another, even if it's assumed that one bunch of vampire and the other are lichens. And while later action scenes are better justified, the final scene being a great example, most of them don't seem to grab me. Really though, what I'm trying to say is that these characters are underdeveloped. Perhaps in the sequels we see more of what makes them tick, and who they are as people, but here? Not so much. Although a little more in the extended edition, which gives our characters that little bit of actual character. A very little more, that is. As the extensions add up to a pointless sex scene, half a monologue about Michael's lost love, and a few shots of Victor's extended awakening. Although, the lichen effects and animatronics do go a long way to making believable werewolves of the actors. And while the dizzying flashbacks seem somewhat jarring to my eyes, they are edited very well, and the whole movie is slick and professional. But that's faint praise. It's slightly sweary, somewhat gory, and definitely not for kids. But is it for me? Well, it rather washes over me to be quite honest. Overall then, it's a humble beginning for a saga that remains popular. And if you like vampires and kick-ass women in black PVC, you'll love it. Personally, I'm not so keen. Though perhaps if I make my way through the sequels, I might have better luck. Oh well. I've been Funky Monkey wishing you better days and better movies. So long, folks.